So I was born in California, in East LA. No, it kind of was. Uh, lived in Buena Park, and born in Anaheim, lived in Buena Park, right across the street from Knott's Berry Farm, just a few miles away from Disneyland. And so I lived there until I was about 10 years old. But it's funny, I've only been to Disneyland like twice in Knott's Berry Farm once that I can remember. We lived so close, but you know what? I didn't care because there's something we did that was, to me, the coolest thing. And that was we went to the beach almost every weekend. How many of you guys can relate? The beach in California, all right. Huntington Beach, Seal Beach, Long Beach, Long Beach. <laughs> Newport. Newport, all right. Laguna, La Jolla, sweet. Sweet, dude, totally. But one of the things uh, that was funny, we moved here when I was 10, and we moved up in October, the, totally, the worst time of year if you're a Californian, to move to Washington. Didn't see the, the sun for like six months. But that summer, when it came around, my mom said, guys, I'm going to take you to the beach. And we were so excited. You know, it's time to go to the beach. So we went, we we're in the Silverdale area, we went down to Illahee State Park, and we got out of the car, and I'm so excited, and we walked down to the water, and I was like, okay, where's the beach? <laughs> and she said, it's right here. And I'm looking at, you know, water, and then rocks covered in barnacles. <laughs> Not cool. <laughs> but one of the things, going to the beach when I was a kid in California, um, you would go out to play in the waves, and kids that you didn't even know would become your bud for like a day. And we'd body surf and, you know, hang out, build sand castles and things like that. And so the building of the sand castle, a sacred art form down at the beach, we would partake in this, this, this building of the sand castle. And, and for that moment, that became the most important thing in the world. You know, you'd always have some little T-Rex kind of kid come by and step on a part of it. You're like, no! There goes my turret. You messed up my castle. And, you know, kids would cry and get upset. And then we'd build it back up. And then after a little while, inev inevitably, the tide over time makes its way up. And the waves start getting closer and closer. And then somebody sounds the alarm. All right, everybody, dig a moat. And so we went out there and we dig a moat. We try to create all these different waterways around our sand castle to preserve it. But it never worked. Sandcastle was always destroyed. And this might surprise you, but the sandcastles I built back then don't exist anymore. <laughs> now, I share that with you because sometimes on this earth, we're like children. We spend so much energy and pride occupied with building sandcastles. Things that don't really matter in terms of eternity. If we were to step back and look at human history, that the tide of time has always destroyed earthly kingdoms. Those temporal expectations that man has come to an end because this world is finite. Men are finite. But the resurrection tells us that there's something more lasting than sandcastles. Something more lasting than even the waves that destroy them. More lasting than time itself. And through the resurrection, we find that hope that's the core around which our faith finds its center of gravity. And that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the resurrection, we see there's a kingdom that is ever increasing and never ending. The resurrection is essential to our faith. The gospel isn't just about Good Friday in the cross, although that be foundational to our sin being forgiven. It was on the cross that Jesus conquered sin. But he conquered death by the resurrection. And so today we celebrate the resurrection because it verifies that Jesus is who he said he is and has accomplished what he said he did on the cross. 
Actually, Paul ponders the point of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, where it says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Why? Because Christians deny themselves their earthly pleasures and earthly kingdoms to live for another world. We live for the desire of the Spirit within. If that's all a fake, if the resurrection wasn't true, then woe are we who miss out on what this world has to offer. But we know that there is something more. In verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In my Bible version, there's an exclamation point. Now, in reading this in the English, verses 3 through 12, you might not catch this, but in the original language when Peter wrote this this book, verses 3 through 12 are the longest run-on sentence you could ever imagine. If you're an English teacher, you would be like, Oh, no. I need to talk to this Peter. But in that day, a sentence like this that's so long and so filled with thick, deep, powerful theology was a way of the Greeks considering this even a hallmark of being a skillful orator. The Spirit of God inspires Peter, an uneducated man, to be skilled in writing the scriptures, and he writes the long sentence all having to do with worship. He's worshiping God here. He's praising and blessing God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for all that he has done in our lives. And he brings up in this the resurrection. Do you have something to praise God for? Enough to write a really long sentence. Enough to sing and jump and shout for joy. Now, if we won the lottery, you might shout and jump and scream and be all excited and tell all your friends because you have all this cash, all this money coming your way. But we have something far better. The lottery is dust. The things of this world will pass away, but through the resurrection, we're reminded that our faith, our inheritance, our relationship with God is eternal. It lasts forever. When we realize what we have in Christ, we can't help ourselves like Peter to praise and worship God more than if we won Powerball. Now it goes on. According to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He ponders God's great mercy first. We've been saved not according to how great we are, but according to God's great mercy. This word mercy means to show kindness or concern for somebody in serious need. Especially in this context, it's the the miserable people that are suffering because of the consequences of sin. God sees us in our desperate need, and Scripture even tells us that before we came to Christ, we were enemies of God. We hated Him. Although He expressed so much love, we had our fist up in His face saying, get out of my life. But it's, His great mercy, that though we be such horrible sinners, he says, I love you, and I am going to do something for you out of my goodness and my kindness that you don't deserve at all. Notice how it doesn't say, according to God's minimal mercy, according to the least amount that he can muster up because he was so irritated at you. No, it says God's great 
mercy. How can you describe great mercy? When we think of a God who is infinite in every way, and when it comes to his mercy, it's also infinite, and we say great mercy, we're saying his mercy is so infinite, it's greater than infinity. Like when little kids, they're like, my dad can beat up your dad. Well, my dad can beat up your dad infinity. Well, my dad can beat up your dad infinity, infinity, infinity. You know, and they go on and on. How do you say God is great in his mercy? It blows your mind. His grace, his mercy is wider, it's deeper, it's longer, it's higher, it's, it's lower than all of your sin. It's overflowing, it's all-encompassing, it's overwhelmingly more than you can comprehend. So you might have come in here this morning thinking, what was me? Sinner. I don't belong in this place. I don't fit in with these Christians. Well, actually, you do, because all of us are horrible, desperate sinners in need of a Savior. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, as one person said. But it's according to his great mercy, his goodness, his kindness, that he reached into our life and he gave us a new birth. It says we're born again. And this word to be born again means to cause to be changed as a form of spiritual rebirth. So there's this radical change in personality, in your spiritual condition, in your position before God. This rebirth is accomplished by or through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Without his resurrection, we don't have a new birth. Now, this gives us a reason for hope. It gives us a reason to be certain about our future salvation because we have a new birth as a child of God. That's who we are now. The same words found in 1 Peter 1.23, just a few verses later, when it says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Now, when it talks about the seed, it's talking about the male's role in reproduction, procreation. The Father's word is what brought about our birth as it has gone out and hit the fertile soil of our hearts, God has initiated with us in springing it to new life. And this new life, this rebirth, is first of all spiritual, but it will and ultimately be physical. Some people find false confidence in genealogy. You know who I'm related to? I spend a little time checking out my family tree and stuff like that. My wife always trumps me. She's related to Queen Elizabeth. That's why she's so proper. <laughs> but we could take false pride in that. Oh, dude, I'm like half Jewish. So Jesus could have been like, you know, a cousin somehow. Man. But you know what about genealogies is people always tend to leave out the stories, the bad stories. Oh, yeah, my fifth great-grandfather was in prison. My sixth great-grandfather was a slave owner. You know, we don't tend to mention those stories. Some were born in a family they wish they weren't born into. So although some find confidence in their family connections, other people find discouragement in it. And it bothers you. It haunts you. Some, as we wish, even Job, wish that they were never born. But God offers a new birth that's higher than any physical birth. Our spiritual rebirth through Jesus Christ. You belong now to a heavenly family that is eternal, that will never forsake you and will always come through for you. But this new birth, notice, he caused. 
You know, when babies are born, they don't like pop out and say, whoo, look what I did. They didn't do anything. They just grew, you know, and even that was programmed in them by God. Same thing when we're born spiritually. We can't say, wow, look what a great person I was, and now I'm a child of God. It's no, I was so horrible, yet God's mercy reached into my life and gave me new birth. I'm here by God's grace. And what we were born into is the title of the message today, A Living Hope. A Living Hope. Hope is that confident and eager expectation that one will obtain something good in the future. A lot of Christians live as if hope is something they're never going to get. C.S. Lewis says this, hope is a continual looking forward to the eternal world. Those things to come that we're confident and eagerly awaiting for. Three great marks of true believers. Things that will last beyond this world. Faith, hope, and love. This is one of those great characteristics that we are supposed to enjoy and exercise through faith. You know, worldly hope passes away. It's like sandcastles. But living hope never dies. And that's a powerful image that the believers in Peter's day needed to know because under Nero, the believers in Rome especially were undergoing massive persecution. To hear that their hope is a living hope gave them an anchor for their souls. Job understood it. Job said this in Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer lives. Amazing that he knew this hundreds of years before Christ. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, not somebody living in that day, my heart faints within me. You know, he's going through such difficulties, but he has that hope, that future hope, that living hope. And that comes through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. As we go on in verse 4, living hope looks forward to an inheritance. It says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This inheritance that we're to receive describes what's in store for Christians. If you look in the Old Testament, when it talks about inheritance, it was like the Jews inheriting the promised land. It was a physical thing. It was tied to the nation of Israel. But we're not Jewish, a lot of us. We have an inheritance that is far greater than the promised land even. The promised land, in a sense, is a shadow of something far greater to come. We are kind of like the Levites, I think, in Numbers 18.20, where it says, And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land. This this is the Levites, the, the family of Aaron. You shall have no physical inheritance in their land. Neither shall you have any portion among them, the Israelites, even though they were Israelites. But God said, I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. God says, I am your inheritance, your great reward. God's people are actually referred to as God's inheritance. His treasure, his precious bride. But it makes sense that we will receive him as our inheritance. Could it be that the great rewards in heaven have to do more with our relationship with God than physical things like gold and kingdoms and powers? 
There's some crazy creatures in heaven that have eyes all over their body. You ever read that in the Bible? You're like, what in the world is that? What would that even look like, you know? What does it look like when they blink? You know, the whole body blinks or something. Why so many eyes? Well, more capacity to take in the glory of God, right? More eyes to see him with. I don't know. What if our rewards have to do with the capacity at which we can experience and enjoy God? Not that everybody doesn't, but apparently there are some creatures that can see that much more. But whatever our inheritance is, it's kind of beyond our comprehension in this world. But we do know that it says it's an un are imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and it's kept in heaven. Nothing can become stained or filthy in this inheritance. It remains shiny and beautiful always. It can't be destroyed. It's permanent. It's indestructible. It's eternal. Now, there are some that promise that you can have the best of both worlds. You can have all this world has to offer, enjoy all the pleasures of this earth, and still have God. You can have one foot on earth and one foot in heaven and still be saved. But I would venture to say that that is false doctrine. What we find in Matthew 6 is that it's an either-or thing. It's not a both-and thing. Jesus says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you value the things on earth more than God, your heart is here. The resurrection points to the reality that this treasure, this inheritance, is real and it is worth forsaking all the things of this earth to store up treasures there. It goes on, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, this passage might be a little confusing at first, but in that day, a healthy eye, that idiom was used to describe a generous If you had a healthy eye, you were generous with your things. Your whole body would be full of light, but if your eye is bad, and again, this idiom means to envy, to have a bad eye, is to always be envying what other people have. Then your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't have one foot on earth and the other in heaven if you think that that's where you're at, or if you're sitting on the fence. The reality is the fence belongs to Satan. It's a deception. That inheritance that we have in Christ reveals where your heart lies. Are we looking forward to it? Do we know that this is ours in Christ and we store up treasures there? And the great news is here, it goes on and says, by God's power, we're being guarded through faith. We're being guarded through faith. Or shielded. Some of your translations say that we're shielded through faith. You know, because this world's kind of a messed up place. There's temptations, there's trials, there's things that try to win our heart back, trip us up, make us fall. But God's power shields his people. So if you're ever scared that you're going to fail, we put our faith in our strong God who shields. 
Let me give you an illustration actually from the Bible. There was a guy named Abram. Before his name was changed to Abraham. And there were five, five kings from the Sodom area and four kings from the east. The four kings from the east came over, conquered the five kings that were right next to the promised land, and then took away Abraham's nephew Lot, all the people and all the goods from that fertile land there. And Abraham heard of it, and guess what? He gets his guys together, 200 and something of them, and he goes and he beats the four kings from the east. How did he do that? I have no clue. By God's power. Now, when he comes back victorious, he enters the valley of the kings. And there he meets two types of kings. One represents the world, and one represents heaven. The one that represents the world, the king of Sodom, came and he said, hey, I'm going to give you all this stuff. But Abraham refused. He said, I made an oath to God that I wouldn't take anything from you, evil king, king of this world. But then there was another king whose name was Melchizedek, priest of God most high. He comes down into the king's valley with bread and wine. Abraham communes with him. This king blesses Abraham. You know what Abraham does as a result? He takes everything that he owns and he gives 10% to that king. Instead of being one that takes from the world, he was one who gave to God's priest. That reveals the kind of man that Abraham was. He trusted in God. And after that, you might be a little bit freaked out saying, oh, I should have taken door number one. I would have had the nice car. I would have had, you know, all these different worldly things. What did I do? What did I do? But God appears to him in a dream to reassure him. And notice what he says, Genesis 15, 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And there we see it. Men and women of faith who have their hopes set on something higher than this earth God is your shield, and he is your great reward. Salvation ultimately is coming, Peter says. It's ready to be revealed in the last time. And this salvation is like being saved from this messed up earth. When Jesus returns and we are not only born spiritually now, but we will be transformed physically then and revealed that we truly are children of God. We're like incognito, like superheroes with the glasses on, like Clark Kent, working some menial job, and people treat us like garbage. Why? They don't know who you are. But one day, when it's revealed, you will be transformed, and it will be seen, and we will be like the risen Christ, transformed and given eternal bodies. Check this out. 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm going to read you these verses, and I know it's a little bit long, maybe, when you're used to hearing messages with short little quips from the Bible. But I'm going to read this to you because it says these are encouraging words that we're supposed to share with each other. It says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do, who have no hope, those who trust in the world. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, amen, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, that those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, 
encourage one another with these words. For us, the resurrection is a reminder that our Lord is living and will return again for us. That salvation we look forward to. But in the meantime, on this earth, we see a living hope is so vital because it helps us to rejoice when things are messed up. Look at the last two verses in 6 and 7. It says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says. In this you rejoice. And all the stuff we heard, this living hope, this inheritance, we rejoice. Even though we suffer? Yes. Why? Because we have a future hope in a living Christ, our living Savior, a living hope that results in present joy. You know how you know that you're on track with this living hope? Is that junk happens and you rejoice anyway? Even through difficulties? And you know what? Everybody experiences difficulties, Christian or non-Christian. But the disciples of Christ will experience especially um, personal uh, attacks. They'll be mistreated for their faith, as Peter was in his day, and the Christians were who he was writing to. Scripture says we're aliens and strangers here, but we should be joyful. Joyful. And our faith is kind of like gold in one way, but it's not like gold in another way. Think about this. It's like gold in that we go through trials And like gold is refined by fire, and it's refined multiple times. It's heated up, impurities rise to the surface, it cools off, and the goldsmith will scrape the impurities off and then go through the process again and heat up that gold and then scrape off impurities and then heat heat it up again over and over. Our faith is like that. We go through difficulties, but God's purifying us. The result though, is not like gold in that gold perishes, but our faith does not. Actually, that refined faith becomes more valuable than any gold, as Abraham knew. And that, when you stand and your faith is tested and you hold on to your living hope and through this thing and that thing and rejoice anyway, when Christ returns, it's going to result in praise, glory, and honor. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. So in conclusion, if you're truly honest with yourself this morning, do you have your hope set on earthly things, or is your hope a living hope based in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I'm going to challenge you with three ideas. Number one, believe in the resurrection. I mean, truly believe. Not just say, in Easter, he's risen indeed, all right. Woo. Let's go out for breakfast, you know. But to hold on to that. Some years ago, an S-4 submarine was rammed by another ship, and it quickly sank. The crew was strapped inside. No way out. Ships rushed to the scene, and Divers went down, and there was one diver that put his helmet up against the sub, and he could hear Morse code tapping on the side of the submarine. And the person inside was tapping out, is there any hope? You know, and that's where humanity is at without Christ. If you're in that place and you know you need a Savior, Maybe today, God is calling you to reach out to him and find this living hope. And he knows all your sin. 
Erwin Lutzer once said, there's more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. God knows. His mercy is great. It's infinite. And when you reach out to him, he will save you. You will experience a new birth. And you can hang on to this living hope in Christ. If that's where you're at right now, and you know God is really making this clear in your own heart, then I want to invite you at this moment, let's just bow our heads and let's respond to him. If you need God's mercy today, the word says to call out upon the name of the Lord. Pray with this. Pray with me in your heart this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin, taking my place, paying the price for me. I receive that free gift of love. I call out upon your name, Jesus Christ, Son of God, save me. Thank you, Lord, that your grace, your mercy is bigger than my sin, bigger than my weakness, and that now as you pick me up and as you give me new birth, I can be sure in this living hope. Fill me with your spirit and help me to follow you all the days of my life. Amen. If you're a believer or you pray that prayer, two things. Number one, look forward to your inheritance. There was a small town in Maine some years ago that was proposed for a site of a hydroelectric dam. And so the word went out, this decision had been made in this town, had many months to prepare for this project that was coming up that would destroy their town and fill it with water. But many months before it ever happened, people noticed all improvements ceased. There was no more painting, no more repairs being made, buildings, roads, sidewalks got shabbier and shabbier even though people had not yet moved away. They were still there in this town. One citizen explained it this way, where there's no faith in the future, there's no power in the present. Maybe spiritually your life has become kind of this broken down town because you're not putting your faith in the future. This living hope that we look forward to, this inheritance that is coming in today. Maybe God's challenging you. Get that other foot off this earth and firmly plant both feet on Christ, the rock. Live your life for him. So if there's something that's taken the place of Jesus as Lord in your heart, as king of your life, I want to challenge you today. Surrender that. And then lastly, rejoice in suffering. I messed up my leg this week. Some of you guys might not have noticed. I hobbled up here. Bad sprain, break, possibly, all this stupid stuff. But I've been kind of like in a bad mood and then I'm okay with it and all this stuff. But I have to say personally, I need to make that decision to rejoice. And I know it's hard when I want to drive myself and not have my wife drive me everywhere. And it's hard on her. When I'm like, hey, park over there. Oh, you better slow down and all these things, you know, because I'm used to driving. Why are you mad at me? I don't get it. If I would just calm down my heart before the Lord and rejoice even though I suffer, how much better would it be for my wife how much better would it be for my own heart? Maybe that's where you're at. And you got to rejoice today. Whatever it may be, this living hope changes everything. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the resurrection. And we do pray that we would live in that reality today. 
and that we wouldn't live as if we hope it's true, but maybe it's not. But no, we know it's true. And that you are alive. May we worship you and please you in every way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.